home, Yay. welcome home. Super excited you all are here at 11 o'clock service. We believe that God has something for you. You're not here by accident, but on purpose. Come so on, good. Jesus. Now, I got Amanda here in the studio with us today. And Amanda, every single week, we ask everyone to tell us where you're at. And if you're on vacation, we wanna know where you're on vacation at. Are you in Australia? Are you where? I don't know, Tennessee. We had someone from Tennessee. I saw Texas one time. Oklahoma one time, Arkansas like last yeah. week I said. Um, where else? I've New seen Jersey, New Jersey, New York. Yeah, all over. All of them. VA, come yep. on. Hi, family. <laughs> Good to see you all. Tell us in the chats right now where you're at. And then also, what's your favorite food right now? Let, let us know what's going on. Uh, we would love to hear from you to know that um, that, you, that, that you're here with us. So. And Pastor looks at the uh, the online, man. He likes to see the hallelujahs, the amens, the prayer requests. Maybe you have a prayer request. I want to encourage you to go to our website. What is it? What's our website? It's the email is, oh, gosh, you put me on the spot. Oh, my goodness. This is my job. I'm going to get fired. No, you're not going to get fired. Don't remember right now. <laughs> it, it, listen, like, church, <laughs> like, listen, I think it's info at lifechurchnow.com. You can send it there. You can send it. It's on the bottom of the screen. How about that? There, there you, you go. go. Come on. Suki's back there doing it for her. Thank you, Miss Suki. We really appreciate you. We really appreciate you. I should have memorized it, too. It's Lord. okay. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. But listen, we want to pray for you. We also want to actually continue to encourage you to be uh, be a family. We're a family yeah. here. We want to hear. If there's something that you need, let us know. We want to hear your testimonies, maybe your prayers. We pray every week here, yeah. here in the house. Matter of fact, our youth are praying every Wednesday. And this is why Amanda's here today to talk to us about our camps that are coming up very soon. I'm excited about it. We have children and youth. And right now, Youth camp, we are looking at numbers that we haven't seen in, in a long time yeah. that are going to camp. So uh, I'm guarantee you we're going to have more than enough <laughs> more than enough kids. I'm excited about it. God is so good. Um, but today, pastors are going to be doing a big ask. We're asking everyone to partner with us and sow into the lives of young people's lives. Listen, yeah. we want to get them to camp. We believe that God is going to God is going to wreck their life. He's going to uh, uh, add fuel to the flame, and they're going to come back on fire for Jesus with a purpose and determination to go out and share the gospel and see their schools, their communities, all saved for the um, for the kingdom of God. And yeah. I'm I'm believing for some miracles to happen. Miracles yeah. are breaking out. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be that. I promise you that. Listen, I believe that God's gonna move. Yeah. But Amanda, um, you've been at camp. You are our superstar leader, and you've been able to sow into the lives of young girls' lives. And I think it's gonna be those seasons you sown are going to actually last for a lifetime. Amen. But we'll see their kids go to camp because yeah. of you. So thank you so much for being a blessing. But talk, tell us about your experience in camp. Yeah, last year was my first year as a leader, and I'm getting to come back again this year, and I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. But um, I touched on it last service, and I'll touch on it again. It's so beyond camp. Um, camp is just the start. It's just the seed planted, how you said. And um, the offering, you guys are like thinking, oh, it's for buses. It's for the facility. It's beyond that. It's for the future of the now generation. Amen. These, Amen. these students do things far beyond I ever did at their age and have yeah. faith that is just so huge. And they really do come back on fire. And we've seen it in our PM services since last year um, when we came back from camp. Mm -hmm. And even in the Wednesday night services mm -hmm. at youth, it's insane to just see. And the relationships that are formed at camp carry on beyond that. You know, I have my group of girls and yeah. it's not just camp. It's day to day. It's a group chat. It's all that. So... Mm -hmm. It's discipleship. Yeah. I'm excited uh, because of this. It's, it's, it's life-changing. Uh, we're changing generational uh, uh, bloodlines. We believe that God is yeah. going to change the course of our young people that go to their families and change their bloodlines and change things in the course of their family. Uh, we're believing that God is going to do so much, not just in youth, but yeah. in children. It does well. And I'm, expi I'm expecting it, you know, the children. Let me just testimony. Uh, last year, they took about 10 students. This year... They're at 30, over 30 wow. students. Come on. Listen, not God. just youth, but also children. Yeah. So listen, uh, not only do we want to tell you, listen, sow a seed into these children and youth life, but also bring your kids into the house. We believe yeah. that God has something for them as well. There is no junior or Holy Spirit. But tonight, 
I need you to show up 6 p.m. tonight. I think God's going to do something. But in this service too, God loves you. God's going to show up. Stand up. Get ready. We love you. But God loves you more. We'll see you. Praise the Lord, Life Church. Praise the Lord, Life Church. This is the day that the Lord has made. We are going to rejoice and be glad in it. I invite you all to come to the front so we can worship the Lord together. of his name everything can change everything can change if you walked in heavy you're gonna walk out light if you walked in weary you're gonna be all right just a mention of his name just a mention of his name just a mention of his name everything can change Everything can change if you want to.
bless your name this morning, Lord. It is that sweet name that we praise. Because your presence changes everything, Lord. It changes the trajectory of our lives. And we thank you for your salvation, Lord. We thank you for what you did on the cross so that we could live again. We don't take it lightly. We don't take it for granted.
on church, you know this. And from the grave arose the Savior. Come on. From my soul rise the soul. How to sing of how you saved me from the dusk until the Come on, from the grave. From the grave arose the Savior. From my soul rise the soul.
Jesus. Come on, is he worthy? Give him praise. Give him praise. Lift your voice. Lift your hands and surrender. Not that we've lost anything, but he's already won everything. Give him praise. Give him praise. Amen. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. Did you, are you glad you came to church this morning? I got um, I to gotta, I gotta share something. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm not sorry. I'm fine. Um, <laughs> you, know, you know why he's worthy to be praised? Because he's the God that'll take the thing that the enemy meant to harm you and use it to propel you into your new season, into your next calling, into what he has for you. And you thought it was gonna destroy you. Like, can I just share with you real quick, like, you know the story that we've all heard before, if you grew up in church, like the story of Peter walking on the water. First of all, Jesus was walking on the water. He calls Peter out of the boat. Peter starts to walk on the water, and the Bible says he starts to notice the wind and the waves, and he begins to sink. And when he sinks, he cries out for Jesus. And the story goes like this. Jesus pulls him up. And then the Bible says, and they just made their way back to the boat. What? Hold on, hold on. Watch this. He steps out of the boat, walks on water. I'm sinking. Jesus, help me. Grab, Jesus grabs him, pulls him up. And then the Bible says, they went back to the boat. How did Peter get back to the boat? The thing that he was sinking in, he had to get pulled up by Jesus. This is why his presence changes everything. And when he wanted to make his way back, oh, all of a sudden, he's walking on top of the water again. Friends, what the enemy meant for you to drown in is the thing that God wants to pull you out of and let you know you can walk on top of sickness. You can walk on top of pain. You can walk on top of hurt because I've pulled you out. You can walk on top of bitterness. You can walk on top of that word that somebody said about you that's not really the truth about what God said about you because I've pulled you out with the enemy meant to destroy you. You can walk on top of again. That's why he's worthy. That's why he's worthy to be praised. I think there's some people it feels like feels like the world is overcoming you. You've been focused on the wind and the waves just a little bit too much. Focus on the one who can pull you out. Focus on the one who can pull you out. Amen? Come on, one more time. Can we give our God some praise this morning? Thank you. Thank you for worshiping with us. Here's what you gotta do. You gotta high five three people and then head back to your seat. High five three people and then head back to your seat. I like that. Look at this. Well, welcome to Life Church, everyone. How are we doing this morning? We good? Yes, yes, yes. Hey, we want to thank you so much for joining us today, whether you're here at our Wesley Chapel campus or watching with us online. Thank you so much for being here, especially if it's your first time here with us. Or maybe you just say, hey, listen, I haven't been here in a while. It's my first time back in a while. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we want to invite you right now, if it is your first time here with us, go ahead and pull out your phone and text the word CONNECTION to the number that's there on your screen. Um, it's gonna send you a link, and uh, it's just a quick little form we want you to fill out because we wanna connect with you. Um, we're not just into like coming to church, but we actually want to be the church, and we wanna walk with you on your journey. And so um, we also invite you after our service is over today, if you're here in the room, um, there in the doors to the back of the room, we have what we call our connections lobby. There are a few of our pastors and partners and team members will be there to answer any questions you might have about our church. Maybe you're wondering, how do I get plugged in? How do I fit into a life group? How do I start serving? All these kinds of things can be answered there in our connections. 
Connections lobby. And so we would love for you to join us there after service is over, as well as we have a gift for you. So make sure you go back there and get that. Everyone, can we give our first time guests a huge round of applause? Thank you, thank you. Um, I got really, um, really exciting news I wanna share with you just in a little bit. We're gonna be taking up um, camp, a special camp offering later on in our service in just a few moments. But first of all, we wanna talk about our normal tithes and offerings. Um, as you leave today, you'll see that there are giving boxes on each exit. You can use the giving envelopes that are there in the seat back in front of you to give that way. As well as you can pull out your phone, you can use our text to give service. You can go online and give as well. And when you do that, either the texting or the online, you can actually set up reoccurring gifts as well. That way you don't forget like I sometimes do. So me and my wife, we set up reoccurring gifts to make sure that we never, ever, ever um, forget. So we encourage you to be a part of what God is doing in this house by planting a seed and, uh, and sowing good seed into great soil here at Life Church. I, I, we got really exciting news, and so I'm going to go ahead and invite Miss Silvana Place to join me up here on the platform. Get up for Silvana. She's joining me because the big news is this. Maybe you've heard, maybe you haven't, but starting actually this coming August, we are officially launching Life Church College, everybody. This is huge news. And so Silvana is actually the director of Life Church College. And uh, we brought you up here because just we want to hear more about it. How do we get signed up, plugged in? Any questions that we might have? I know we have a meeting coming up as well. Can you share some of that information for Absolutely. us? Absolutely. Well, as Pastor Ross shared, we are just so excited um, that we get to start a school of ministry called Life Church College here this year in August. And let me just say, Life Church College is for anyone that's ready to take their next step into ministry. Once you join at Life Church College, you'll have the opportunity to learn from and serve side by side multiple ministry leaders, um, and that will give you really an understanding of what ministry life is like. And at Life Church College, our main focus is going to be discipleship, and um, we will be—you'll have grounded biblical training as well, along with ministry experience that will be hands-on. And we will do that all in an atmosphere that hosts the presence of God. If you want to learn more, we have a booth set up outside. I'd love to meet you and help you get started. Um, we also have an interest meeting next Sunday here at our Wesley Chapel campus at 4.30 p.m. I'd love to meet you. And if you are online today, look to the screen. Um, there's a QR code that you can get more information about the college, or you can go on our webpage under college. That's awesome. Come on. Are we excited about Life Church College? This is incredible. We just had a meeting the other day talking about it, and I am so excited. I'm so excited about what God's going to do here at Life Church through Life Church College, and uh, for so many people that are going to be empowered yes. and equipped yes. with real life practical yeah. ministry experience. That's going to be awesome. Um, like we said, we're going to take up um, a special camp offering here in just a moment. But first, um, we have our camp coming up in just I think we're three weeks out now, Pastor Frank, something like that. Three weeks out. Let's go, and um, we want to share with you, our students are super excited about it, that's great. We wanted to share with you um, a little bit of a story of one of our students that went to camp last year. So check out the screens. This is an awesome story. Check this out. When you get into praise, everybody's jumping around, having fun, smiling. It's something that is just like deep. Even though we're all on teams against each other, it feels like the room is one because <laughs> we're just all tight knit by the end of the camp. I had just gotten to the church three years ago. This camp rolled around and that's when I knew like, this is home. This is a place I want to be. We see each other all the time at <laughs> Wednesday Youth, and this is a place I want to go every week because I know people will be there to support me, and I have family there, and I also have God there. I think that's really important because they're, they can be a support system for you. If you are going through something after you come back from camp, maybe something happened, like you have people there that you went to the camp with, grew together with, and they'll give you advice and they'll help support you. 
I personally enjoyed the lip sync battle aspect of it the most just because I got to be on stage, do a little solo thing, and then get out of there. But it was super fun. But then once it gets to the slower worship songs where you really get the feeling of God's presence in the room, you kind of feel like a unity among everybody. It's kind of like you're all intertwined on one on everybody's journey, I should say. And it's just, I don't know, camp is a crazy experience for that, so. God's presence to me, I feel it as kind of like an energy in the room. You kind of get a sense of his presence when you're in worship, like you're in that deep, deep prayer kind of state. It's kind of a deep sense of calmness, I should say. For me, it's important to be in God's presence just because there are some days in my life that are so stressful, like sometimes you don't want to deal with everyday things and God's presence can instantly flip that over if you're listening to worship music, if you're praying, if you're reading the Bible, if you're doing devotional in the morning. You are all good to embrace his presence. <laughs> Just watching the video, it is obvious that student camp is exciting, it's fun, it's energetic, lots of games and interaction, but what I need you to understand more than anything else, student camp is transformative. These kids come back from camp having had encounters with the presence of God, and we all know that His presence changes everything. And so when they get away at camp, they're away from uh, other friends, you know, that, that maybe uh, they get to be alone and, and they're, they're in the presence of God, they're, they're with their peers, they're in ministry, they're, they're in worship, they're under the word, and God is working on them. Lots of what I call FaceTime in the altars, face-to-face -face time with God in the altars, where God is moving in their hearts, moving in their lives. It is transformative because God is in the business of transforming lives. I'm up here this morning and I have the honor and the privilege to invite you to partner with God to make an investment in futures. Make an investment in the future, not only of our students, but if you make an investment in the, in the future of our students, you're making an investment in the future of the church. Because they're the now church. They're the now generation. They're the ones that are leading the way. In fact, uh, you'll notice in these 11 o'clock services, and then if you're back in the 6 o'clock, you'll notice it again, that these altars are just jam-packed full of students who are unashamedly, uninhibited in their praise and their worship of God. Well, that all began last summer at student camp. They came back, and the Sunday after camp, I mean, they emptied the seats in that section over there to my left, your right, and they all flooded into this front of the church we call the altar, and they have been there every weekend ever since. Why? Because God got a hold of their life, and they went back to school different. They came back to church different. They came back to your home different. Because God was at work in their lives when they were at camp. Make an investment in their life. You're making an investment in their future and in the future of the church. There's an account in the book of Luke where Jesus is out teaching and preaching. He's going from town to town, village to village, neighborhood to neighborhood. And there's a group of women traveling with him. And the Bible says they gave to his ministry out of their substance. Why? Because God had changed their life. They wanted to be part of seeing God change the lives of other people. And so they financially supported the ministry of Jesus. It says right here in, in Luke chapter 8. Now I came to you today to appeal to you. I came to you today to invite you to partner with God, partner with our student ministries to see lives changed. I'm asking you to invest in the future. I'm asking you to invest in the future of the church. I keep coming back to that because when we invest in the future, 
we step into the future because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You say, Ed, how do I do it? Well, on the screen behind me, you'll see up there in the top left corner a QR code. We're big into QR codes around here. We've got QR codes for everything. <laughs> this one is to give you the opportunity to send youth to camp. Last year, because of your generosity, several of our students were able to go because they received scholarships. I would love to just see that number continue to increase and rise this year because the more students we're able to send, the more lives we can see changed. You can give by way of the QR code, but we also have our giving containers up here. We don't pass those down the row anymore, but we do make them available in moments like this when we're receiving what I call a second offering. You say, Ed, how do I do that? In the seat back of the row ahead of you is an offering envelope, looks like this. All you have to do is put a check in there, put some cash in there, put lots of money in there, shout lots of money. Lots of money equals lots of change. You didn't get that. Lots of money equals lots of change. And then what we're going to do in a moment, we're going to enter his gates with thanksgiving. We're going to come into his courts with praise. We're going to sing a song. We're going to just, we're going to do that song again? Okay, we're going to do that. The one you get all excited about. That one, yeah, that one. But we're going to give to, to, to giving him praise today. And I'm going to ask you to leave your seat. I'm going to ask you to come down front. I'm asking you to drop your offering in the bucket. But I want you to understand, you don't have to do this. You get to do it. It's a totally different mindset. It puts a bounce in your step. It puts a smile on your face. It puts joy in your heart when you give to the Lord. Amen? Bible says, give the Lord. Give glory to His name. And today we're going to go past the give the, the glory. We're going to give Him some cash. Are you not excited this morning? Take your pulse. See if you're alive. So I'm going to ask you to stand up on your feet at the mention of his name. Lives are changed. Father, because we are a transformed life, we want to invest in the lives of others who likewise can be transformed. Father, I pray right now as we're about to make an investment in the future of these students. As we're about to make a deposit into the kingdom's business, I pray blessing and favor over us as we do it now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Come on, let's make that declaration this morning. If you walk through this, if you walk through if you walk through you're gonna walk out. Just the mention of his name. Just the mention of his name. Just the mention of his name. Everything can change. Everything can change. If you walk in you're gonna walk out. Just a mention of his name. Just a mention of his name. Everything can change. Everything can change. If you walk deep down, you're gonna walk out of If you walk deep in, you're gonna feel your love. Just a mention of his name. Just a mention of his name. Just a mention of his name. Everything can change. Everything can change. If you walk in broken, you're gonna walk out whole. If you walk in lost, he's gonna save your soul. Just a mention of his name. Just a mention of his name. Just a mention of his name. Everything can change. Everything can change. Come on, everyone. 
Jesus today? My Bible tells me neither is there salvation in any other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. There's power in the name of Jesus. I said there's power in the name of Let's try that one more time. There's power in the name of There's healing in the name of There's deliverance in the name of There's change in the name of The name that's above every name is Every knee will bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God that who is Lord? Oh, come on, put your hands together. Hallelujah! Jesus, Jesus, how I love him! Hallelujah! Amen! Now, but now, 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 now. Now, before you're seated, this is the father in me. Actually, this is the grandfather in me. I got excited when I saw parents and grandparents bringing some money to send students. I about went to tears, went about to fell to my knees when I started seeing students and children. You don't get this. Because they are changed, they want to see their peers changed. Amen? I'm going to ask you one question. Are you ready to receive from the Word of God? I must have wax in my ears. I got to get that new gadget that goes in, looks like a rotor rooter and pulls it out. You know what I'm saying? Forget the Q-tip. Are you ready to receive the Word of God? Yeah. Now you need to understand, when you receive the Word of God, it's going to produce transformation on the inside of you. So I'm asking you one more time, are you ready to receive from the Word of God? Yeah. All right, go ahead, take your seat, team. Thank you. I got a, I got a text message in between services from a uh, a preacher that used to worship with us, he and his family and the whole clan moved up to Knoxville. Some of you know them. And uh, I get a text from him every week because he watches our service online. Then he goes to his service in, 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 in person, okay? And uh, he, said, he said, man, I really miss the passion that you preach with. Well, the reason I can preach with such passion is because I preach like it's the last time I'm going to get to preach. I don't want to get to heaven and have Jesus say, why'd you bring all that with you? You should have left it on the field. So I want you to buckle up, bucko. I, want you to, I don't want you to settle in. I want you to sit on the end of your seat, but I want you to have a seatbelt on because I'm going to take you on a roller coaster ride today. I'm going to take you up and I'm going to take you down. I'm going to take you around some curves and I'm going to make you swoop down on the blow because we're going to go on a journey today. Now tonight, everybody shout tonight. There's a shift that has occurred in our evening services in particular. It's, it's already bleeding up into the morning services. It's a shift in the spirit realm that you can't explain, but you can't contain. And you cannot deny. There's something different that's happening. And I want you to understand the why it's happening, not just the what it is. For weeks now, a group of people have been gathering at 5 o'clock in WC1, WC2, two of our classrooms, at 5 o'clock, and some of them come in at 10 after, some of them come in at 5.30, whatever, and we've been praying for the evening service, for God to move. Now, if you cook, if you maybe you want to make a chicken, a roasted chicken, you take the chicken, you got a recipe, the recipe says uh, temperature of the oven 375 degrees and you got to cook it for an hour. You don't take that cold, that stone cold chicken and drop it in a stone cold oven. You preheat the oven and then you put the chicken in. Because if you put the chicken into a stone cold oven, it's not going to be completely changed When the time is up, 
What's been happening is we've been preheating the oven so that when the timer goes off and the benediction is spoken and we leave, there's some changed lives. And so what's going to happen beginning tonight? I, I prepped them last Sunday night. I'm prepping you this morning. From now on, until Jesus tells me different, at 5 o'clock, we're going to diminish the the lighting in the room here, we're going to put some music on or we're going to go live. I'm not sure yet how much we're going to do either one of those, but we're going to create an atmosphere in here where people can come in and pray before the service. Now, if you can't get here at five, that's fine. If you can't get here 10 after, quarter after, I don't care. We're going to go from five to about 540, and then we're going to break the room so you can go use the potty, find your seat, kind your neighbor, whatever. But we're going to preheat the room because we believe that prayer changes atmospheres. Now, tonight, I'm going to begin a, a new line of teaching out of the same passage I'm going to present this morning. It's called Zion is Calling Me. It's going to be, a, it's going to be a, a time where we begin to understand what the call of God is on our lives, and it's not what you think it is. You think the call of God is to serve as an usher. You think the call of God is to do this and do that and teach this and preach that. The call of God is to glorify Him, to, to worship Him, and to honor Him. So we're going to go in there tonight, and I hope you'll be back with us in that evening service. Now, um, part of the shift that we're experiencing here at Life Church is something I've talked about a little bit. And that is that I don't believe God has called us to be a survival church. He's called us to be a revival church. Jesus is not coming back for less than what he left. He left a church in full-blown revival, Acts chapter 1, okay? And, and, and he's coming back for one that's in full-blown revival. Now, you sit there, you go, wait a minute, revival is an old-school term. No, it's not. It's in Psalm 85 when the psalmist said, will you not revive your people again? He didn't say, will you inspire them? He didn't say, will you teach them? Will you educate them? Will you inspire them? Will you inform them? No, he said, will you revive them? If you stop and you look around when you consider the culture in which we are living, when you observe the condition of our country, our culture, even the contemporary church, I only got three words. We need revival. Why you say that? Because we've been preaching survival messages for so long, people think that's normal. Survival messages, they're, they're comfortable. Revival messages are uncomfortable. I don't care how long you've been saved and walking with Jesus, Holy Ghost will find something in your life that needs adjustment. Yeah. You see, survival-minded churches are dull. They're dry. I mean, they're just waiting for the coffin lid to close. Revival churches are loud. And they are lively. They're giving birth. Revival churches afflict the comfortable, while the survival churches comfort the afflicted. Now, there is a time to comfort the afflicted. Don't get me wrong. There's a time for that. But not all the time. There needs to be those moments when a preacher comes to the platform and comes to his podium and begins to call the people of God back to God. That's what we're doing right now. The message we're going to begin here in just a few moments is called The Quest. And just so you know, that I, I, I'm smart enough to know that that was our VBS theme. They got it from me. I didn't get it from them. Just saying, okay? It all starts with this one statement. People who are not hungry typically do not come to the table at mealtime. They don't come to the table if they're not hungry. It is that sense of hunger that draws people to the table when the food is His presence. And I know that there are some in the room that will say, oh, I had a face-to-face -face encounter with God. How many decades ago? I mean, even bread gets moldy. I hope you fasten your seatbelt because we ain't slowing down. The proof of desire is in the pursuit. I've said that for a long time. Proof of desire is in the pursuit. The proof that you're hungry, you mean you come to the table. 
Proof of desire is in the pursuit because action always speaks louder than words. You see, if there is no recognizable, tangible sense of pursuit, that is an evident sign that desire is absent. Ladies and gentlemen, I leave every service hungrier than I came in. Because all it takes for me is to just get a little bit from God and I want more. You see, in the natural, when you eat and you, and you, you stuff your face, okay, when you eat, your hunger and your appetite go away. But in spiritual things, in the, in the unseen realm, the more you eat, the hungrier you get. And so I can always tell whether the food is from God or the food is from man. Because if you go away hungrier than you came in, I can tell you right now, God's working on your spirit, man. And he's cultivating a greater capacity for more of him. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, the prophet writes this on behalf of God. He said, and you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. And the very first part of the next verse says, I will be found of you. Now today I want to begin to reveal to you the very real hunger of my heart for the church of this generation. I have to define and describe and I help you identify what the word generation means to add. Generation is not age definitive. It doesn't mean, you know, if you're a student, you're part of the next generation. No, you're the now generation. If you're in the church right now, you're part of the now generation. It doesn't matter about your age. See, a generation is a group of people of all ages and backgrounds moving through time together, having shared experiences. We talk about the World War II generation, okay? They, they were everything from infants to senior adults because they were moving through time together having a shared experience. And so when I talk to you today, I want you to understand this is my heart for the church of this current generation. Our theme in the coming weeks is simply the quest. Now, when I looked that up in that word quest up in the thesaurus, Roger's thesaurus, I came across words like search, Crusade, you know, Indiana Jones, the great crusade, okay, he was on a quest. Cause, chase, passion, pursuit, and the word pilgrimage is among that list. In Psalms chapter 84, the sons of Korah write these words. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. That particular phrase of that particular verse has gripped my heart. In fact, it's got a hold on me and it won't let go. My heart is set on a pilgrimage. It is set on a quest. My quest is to see a genuine heaven sent, not man-made, man-manipulated, a heaven sent move of God, a heaven sent outpouring of the Spirit of God in our day and age. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a move of God. I'm set. That word set means bent, entrenched, established, firm, focused, fixed, immovable, resolved, resolute, settled, and I like the last one, locked in. I'm on a quest to see God release revival to Life Church. But I don't want it to stop there. I'm on a quest. I'm set. I'm on a pilgrimage to see God release revival through Life Church to our region. Now, before I go too far in the opening message I, regarding the quest, I do need to give you Ed's, Ed's description and definition of the word revival. It is the sustained presence and power of God that results in transformation or change. Let me say it again. It is the sustained presence and power of God that results in transformation or change. Now, I don't know what camp you're from. It doesn't matter to me. But I need you to understand what revival is not so you'll know what revival is. Revival is not a sequence of services where you hire somebody from the outside to come to the inside thinking they can bring the outside to the inside. 
It's, it's, not, it's, not about, it's not about somebody coming with a bunch of canned sermons in a briefcase from 45 miles away. You can't plan for a revival. It's a move of God. And you're not going to put God in a box. Here's another thing revival is not. And I know that I've got to unlearn you before I can learn you. You see, we think that when people get prayed for and they fall on the floor, that's revival. No, it's not. Because so many of those people that go down get up the same. If you fall on the floor and you get up the same, it wasn't God that put you on the floor. It was the overzealous preacher. <laughs> Revival is not people laughing, mooing, barking, howling. Amen. Revival is transformative. It means that I'm going to be different when I walk out than what I walked in. And please understand, revival is not the whole room talking in tongues. Classical Pentecostals just got, Ooh. Charismatics went, Ooh. no, because some people that I hear talk in tongues can't talk to their wife or their husband or their kids nice. Well, that really got me excited. The kids were really excited about that one over there. It's not just about the gifts of the Spirit being in operation. It's about the fruit of the Spirit being in demonstration. I said, is, revival is not about the gifts of the Spirit, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of Spirit, gifts of healings, working of miracles, and gift of faith. It's not just about the gifts of the Spirit being in operation. It's about the fruit of the Spirit being in demonstration. Let me ask you a question. A healthy bird, how many, how many wings does a healthy bird have? Two, not one. If you had only had one, you'd be flapping around in circles. <laughs> Gifts of the Spirit, one wing. Fruit of the Spirit, the other wing. Oh, now, don't, don't shout me down when I'm preaching this good. So again, I'm going to go back to it. Revival is the sustained, that sense of the sustained presence and power of God that results in change. And we want to be a church that hosts the presence of God because we believe his presence changes everything. That's our quest. That's our pursuit. That's our passion. That is our pilgrimage. It becomes, uh, our, our, our echo is the words of Jesus when he said, on earth as it is in heaven. On earth, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now here's, here in Psalm 84, we see an individual that's on a quest. And his quest is described quite clearly in verse seven. He says, they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. Zion is not just a physical place. It is a metaphorical place. Zion is not just a physical place. It is a figurative place. It's the presence of God. Now, he does three things in this journey. The first thing is this. If you're taking your notes, here's the way to write it down. First thing he's doing, he's longing, longing for God. Verses 1 and 2 simply say, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart, my flesh cry out for the living God. He's longing. To get to the house of God. He's longing to get into the presence of God. He has this intense desire for passion. He's got this desire for God. He's desperate to be found in his presence. I love what David said in Psalms 27. I, this, this one phrase just always jumps out at me. One thing. He says, one thing I have desired of the Lord. That will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Ladies and gentlemen, he is focused on one thing, and that one thing is God's presence. Now, God's presence here, I understand, I understand where the theologians in the room are going, but he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. Jesus said, if two or three gather in my name, I will be there in their midst. I get that. I get the omnipresence, but I also understand there's a sense of the manifest presence of God. 
And what he's talking about here is a conscious awareness of the presence of the Lord wherever he goes. So if he's in Walmart, he's still conscious of the presence of the Lord. If he's, if he's at school, he's still conscious of the presence of the Lord. If he's in church, he's conscious of the presence of the Lord. Psalms 42 gives us a real clear understanding of how people can yearn and long for the presence of God. It says in Psalm 42, 1, as the deer pants for the water brook, so, my, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for you, for the living God. When, I, when shall I come and appear before him? He's yearning for God when he's in the midst of his distressful times. Psalm 63 says it this way, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your glory and your power. The psalmist is simply helping us to understand that there's going to be a, an action that is associated with our perceived desire. There is no other way to say this. There's no other way to shape this other than for me to say the psalmist is consumed with a craving that can only be satisfied by the presence of God. Amen. Billy Graham put it this way for many years. He said, in the heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl, there's a God-shaped vacuum that only God can fill. I have a message for the contemporary church. I have a message for the church of our day. I have a message for the church that has been more cultural than, than, than spiritual. Stop trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. Amen. Begin to realize that what your soul is yearning for, what your spirit man is crying out for, is not more information, not more instruction, not more this and not more that. Your spirit man will only be satisfied by spiritual food, and that is only found one place, and that's in the presence of God. And so if we're going to pursue anything or anyone, it's going to be the presence of of God. The church of today, the modern church, the contemporary church, is not going to experience genuine revival until it recultivates a hunger for God's presence. We lack passion. We desire, we desire, uh, when we're, where we desire God, we're simply not hungry, ladies and gentlemen. Church is not hungry. We come in and we go out, but we're not different. We come in, we sing the songs, and we go out, but we never worshiped. People who long to encounter the presence of God, they're, they're, they're obsessed with, they are consumed by a, a holy hunger for God's presence. And here's why. Because they know without his presence here, this is just a building. It's just a building. See, we can clear all the chairs out, put tables in, and it can become a banquet hall. We can line this up, and, and, and we can bring in a, a band, and, and, and we can make it a concert hall. But it's only his presence that moves us from a building to becoming the sanctuary of the Most High God. You see, without his presence, they know, without his presence here, we're just conducting gatherings. We're just having religious observances. Without his presence, we simply sing songs, but we don't actually praise him. We don't actually worship him. Without his presence here, we come in and we go out, but nothing changes in our lives. Our marriages remain the same. Our families are still a mess. Without his presence, we are simply going through the motions. Or as Paul put it, we have a form of godliness, but we deny the power that godliness produces. When we long for and encounter God's presence, everything changes. Number two, he's traveling to God's presence. He longs for God's presence. Now we're talking about he's traveling to God's presence. It says in verse five, blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. Now, in verse 5, I, I really believe the writer is telling his readers to back off. In other words, 
I got my mind made up. You're not going to change my mind. I'm on a pilgrimage. I'm focused on one thing and one thing only. And that is getting from point A to point B. And point A is where I am. Point B is the presence of God. He's saying my heart is set on encountering God's manifest presence. My, main, my mind is made up. So here's the bottom line, church. I'm going to do whatever I have to do for as long as I have to do it, as long as it takes to see revival. God's sustained presence here. When I look at that verse of Scripture and I think I want God's presence more than I want anything else because I realize that it's God's presence that's going to change your marriage. It's God's presence that's going to change your finances. It's God's presence that's going to change your life. It's God's presence that's going to change your kids. And the parents and grandparents ought to be crying out to God all the more. It's, it's God's presence, ladies and gentlemen, that, that makes us who we are. And that is the light of the world and the soul of the earth. Now, in, when I talk about revival, you need to understand, just be, let me be real with you. It's unique. You're gonna, if, if you're in a revival culture, it's going to be unique. It's going to be unusual. And it might be a little bit uncomfortable. Because you might be sitting and all of a sudden start squirming. He's talking about stuff that I don't want him to talk about. Just leave me alone. I like it the way I am. Just, just leave me alone. Don't mess with me. Don't make me change. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, you, you got to get used to change. First of all, you can't get saved without experience change. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Okay? You can't get saved without experiencing change. And by the way, you can't get to heaven without being changed. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, we will all be changed. And the twinkling of an eye at the sound of the last trumpet. And so get used to change because from the time you get saved to the time you get to heaven, you're just experiencing one change after another change after another change. And if you're not changing, you're dying. You see, I want to see that God's presence in manifestation. I want to see God's power in demonstration. I want to see prodigal sons and daughters come home. I, I want to see blind eyes opened. I want to see sick people healed. I want to see cancers dissolved. I want to see bondages and habits broken off of people's lives. I want to see people move from understanding religion to understanding righteous living. It's going to be unexplainable. There's some stuff that's going to happen in a revival culture. You're going to go, what the heck? I'm sorry, I just offended you. <laughs> By the way, that was intentional. Yeah, it's going to be unexplainable. You're not going to, if you can explain it, ain't God. That's why they're called miracle signs and wonders. You know what a wonder is? I wonder what that was all about. That's all that is. But here's what I need you to understand more than anything else. I'm convinced it will also be uncontainable. And I believe it'll be undeniable. Because when those kids start coming back, when those adults start coming back, when those parents start coming back, when those grandparents start coming back to God and seeing genuine transformation of their lives, you're not going to be able to deny that you're in a revival culture. My passion for God's presence is the driving force of my pilgrimage. It's my passion. There is no changing my mind. I am set. No doubt about it. Revival. God's presence. God's sustained presence is my quest. I desire no other marketing. I'm all about marketing. I got a marketing degree, okay? I'm all about marketing. I understand marketing. But I desire no other marketing method. I desire no other branding identity. My goal, my quest, is for people to be able to say when they leave our worship gatherings, surely the presence of the Lord is in that place. I don't want them to come in and say, wow, isn't Ed a good communicator? Wow, didn't Ed bring it today? No, ladies and gentlemen, I want people to come in and go back out, and here's going to be their testimony. Wow, God is great. Revival preaching is not always A, B, C, one, two, three. It's not always easy. It's messy. It, always, it won't always look really good. I want them to walk out of here knowing that they encountered the presence of God. They couldn't explain it, but they couldn't deny it. 
I want them to leave saying the presence of God was so powerful in that place today that my life was impacted. My life was changed. I want them to go out having had a Saul of Tarsus experience on the road to Damascus where he had this, this millisecond encounter with the risen Christ and he left a completely different person because he went as Paul the apostle and he didn't have his life changed only. He changed the lives of those around him and he literally changed history. I think we need some planet shakers to come alive. I, need, I think we need to see some history makers to come alive. I think we need to see some change agents come on the scene. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a move of God. Verse 6, 7. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it. and They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God. Here he's telling us that we will encounter difficulty on the road. You need to understand that. It's not going to be smooth sailing. Okay? I'm going to preach some sermons people ain't going to be so happy about. I will not tell you when I'm preaching them. Yeah, really. He's telling us that we're going to encounter difficulty, perhaps even some pain in the process of appearing before God in Zion. Zion meaning his presence. But he, he's, this, 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 this psalmist here, he is willing to endure the present pain and discomfort in exchange for God's manifest presence. The pain, what are you talking about, Ed? Pain of being misunderstood. The pain of being misrepresented. The pain of people labeling us radicals, extremists, nonconformists. Oh, you're one of those. Yeah, I am. And happy about it. When our hearts are set on pilgrimage, we are going to experience some difficulties. Why, Ed? Because Satan isn't going to make it easy on us. Because he wants, he knows, that if he can keep us nominal in our spiritual pursuit and normal in our church pilgrimage and, and pursuit and passion, then he knows he's going to keep us operating in the natural. He does not want us to shift gears and move over into the supernatural. Because if we ever encounter the presence of God, if we ever get that taste of the more, he knows that, that taste will lead us out of natural into supernatural. I'm hungry for more. Years ago, there was a song that was really big in my heart. It said, more of you, more of you. I've had it all, but what I need is more of you. Of things I've had my fill, but yet I hunger still, empty and bare. Lord, Hear my prayer for more of you. I'm hungry for more than normal church. I'm hungry for more than nominal church. I want more. Lastly, he's communing with God. Verse 10, he says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper or a gatekeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. First we saw his passion, then we saw his, his pursuit or his path. But for me right now, this is the crescendo of the entire passage. He is simply saying, there is no place on the planet I would rather be than here in your presence. It is obvious that his passion for God's presence caused him to pursue God's presence because he saw God's presence as a priority. Because he was hungry, he came to the table. Drifting back to Psalms 27 verse 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, being conscious of his presence to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Drifting over into the New Testament, coming through the cross and the resurrection and the ascension. I want to talk about the New Testament just for a moment. In John chapter 12, Jesus is teaching and some Greeks come and they approach Philip and they said, we want to see Jesus. Something on the inside of them said, nothing else matters. 
I don't care what the environment is, whether I like it or I don't like it. I don't care what music they sing or what style of music they sing. I don't care about any of the amenities or the elements. I just want to see Jesus. Jesus was, he is, and he always will be the center of it all. People that are coming through the doors of every church, whether they realize it or not, they really just want to see Jesus. They're hungry for the presence of God. They're hungry for a fresh sense of his presence in their lives. In a moment, we're going to go back and we're going to sing a song you're familiar with, Jesus at the center of it all. We're going to stand in a moment. And here's my ask today. And I need you to get used to this because for so long, the modern church has repurposed the altar area for other things. This is a place where people's lives are changed. In a moment, I'm going to invite you if you want to just come and just cry out to God, just, just make that declaration of passion, Jesus, be the center of it all. The, the, this morning, I want you to understand that the train that I am the, the, the engineer of called Life Church, we're getting ready to leave the station. And back in the early days of a railroading, when a train was getting ready to leave the station, a conductor would walk out and he would say, all aboard! And those that got on board got to the destination. Those that didn't, didn't. The engineer is pulling us out of the station right now. And I'm just going to play the role of the conductor. All aboard. If you're ready to get on board, if you're ready to have a fresh encounter with God, or maybe you just need to say, God, God, awaken my hunger for you. Maybe you experienced a face-to-face -face encounter with God at a student camp. Maybe yours was at a VBS. Maybe yours was at a quote-unquote revival service somewhere where God touched you and you knew it was God. Something <sighs> was undeniable. The Bible says where there is no wood, the fire goes out. We got to keep fuel on the fire. How do you fuel the fire? Go back to the fire. In a moment, we're going to sing that song. I'm asking you. In fact, you know what? Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. Stand to our feet. They're going to begin to sing. And if you're hungry for a fresh encounter that'll bring you face to face with God I'm going to invite you to leave your seat don't worry what anybody around you thinks and just find your way up front and have some time with God if he's dealing with your heart it's really an important thing to do business before you leave so as we sing this song you can feel free to leave your seat and find your way down front come on let's do it
God, we recognize nothing else matters if it's not all about you. If it's not all about you. God, I pray that we would take this challenging message today. And like Pastor said, it's not just one of those where we look to each other as we exit the building and go, well, that was a good message today. No, 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 no. And we'd walk out of here saying our God is good. But we'd walk into tomorrow saying he's still good. Maybe Tuesday we have an encounter with somebody else who says, man, your God is good. And on Wednesday we have a conversation with somebody that reveals to them that God is still good. He is still on the throne. He is still in control. God, that's our hope. That's our prayer. Would you use us now this week? to be your vessels, to be your people who are called by your name to go out, to go out and carry the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead that lives on the inside of us into the world around us. Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you ahead of time for what you're going to do. For everybody who came forward this morning, God, I pray a blessing over them right now to say that they're on board, they're ready. Father, now take us somewhere and let us be a part of what you're doing. It's in your name we pray and everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Come on one more time, can we give our God some praise this morning? Thank you, Pastor, for such an incredible word. Come on, can we honor our senior pastor, Pastor Ed Russo, what an incredible anointed word he brought this morning. Hope and pray that you'd come back um, tonight and be more hungry than ever. I want to remind you of just a couple things before we head out today. Remember, you've got um, Life Church College and Camp questions. We've got a we've got a booth set up in our cafe lobby. We would love for you to join us there. For all of our first time guests, please join us in our connections lobby. And remember that tonight, tonight. Somebody say tonight. Say it a little bit louder. Say tonight. Tonight, we've got church at 6 o'clock, but don't forget, we've got prayer right here in this room at 5 p.m. We hope to see you there. We're going to end with one more song together as we head out today.